So welcome back to session three of CEE 120B 220B. Or welcome to 120B 220B, as the case may be. Uh, today we are going to like to really start uh, diving into some of the specifics of the design project you're going to be working on, and in particular look at some of the things you often do just as you're getting started, just you know, taking a design program at its highest level from just some ideas about what you'd like to be in your building into really starting to think about in some detail the kinds of spaces that you want to put inside your buildings as well as how you organize them both from an architectural standpoint to kind of make sure it all makes sense in terms of how the building is going to be used and flow nicely but also starting to think a little bit about how as we organize our spaces it starts having an impact on our mechanical systems or if we think about our mechanical systems, we may want to think about organizing the spaces a little bit differently based on the uh, different functional needs and requirements that, you know, there's sort of a logic to how big buildings get organized. So we'll look at some big buildings and how we organize them. Okay, just to get going in general in terms of recapping and getting all caught up for everyone about what we're up to. Um, out there on Canvas, there's a couple of different things we've added out there that'll hopefully provide some background and context in terms of what we've done. Um, you'll find out there there's some examples of integrated buildings, for example, the Audubon Center was one we showed during the first class session, I think it was, um, that just really had a lot of both architectural, mechanical, and structural features all kind of integrated together. Hey, okay. So that's a great one to look at in terms of sort of seeing the types of uh, buildings and kind of wells that we're going to be using in the course. Um, there's a file full of folder, or uh, files, there's a folder full of files, I should say, just talking about the whole integrated design project, the project you're gonna be working on. And in that folder, there are things like, oh, both the brief for the uh, Sustainable Design Center, one of the projects that people are really choosing to work on, as well as some site files for some of the locations around the Stanford Foothills. There's so ones, the north side, kind of in the dish, the others on the south side, though, towards Jasper Ridge and the lake over there. But a couple of different locations that are possibilities for creating this building with a project uh, description, the program that's described in this. But some of the people in the class will be working on different sites and different projects, and that's okay too. So at some level, if you're new, just kind of like uh, learning about all of this, we'll be talking about sort of a sustainable design center, but also you'll hear us talking about other people's individual buildings, which may be a little bit different. Because everyone's ultimately gonna be designing a building where you have the opportunity to kind of really flesh out all the different uh, systems, the architectural systems, the structural systems, the mechanical systems, and really use that as a vehicle for integrating everything all together. Okay, so that's where we're going at a high level. In terms of the individual sessions, there's a couple things I added there I want to make you aware of. Under session two, okay, I actually put some stuff out there. There's a really good reference all about passive design. There's really a great series of books by Francis Ching, which is called Building Construction Illustrated. And within there, there's a lot of good just information that's out there. Uh, just, just summarizing at a really high level, you know, different aspects of buildings and how we design them. So in the passive design section of that book, there's just really all sorts of interesting information out there. Actually, I have to scroll this, don't I? Hang on. Just talking about, oh, thinking about the topography, the natural forces, a little about solar radiation, and how we orient buildings relative to solar radiation. So just general principles of, for example, passive solar design. So if you haven't taken a build, an energy efficient building class or one of those classes, um, it's a really good quick overview. If you have taken those classes, it's a really great you know, summary of a lot of that information. So just, you know, uh, we put that all out here just as reference for you to, uh, to kind of use and take advantage of. So there's uh, really for each of the different sections of the class, typically a little bit of a, just kind of background to help you get going. For today's class, there's actually several different things out there. There is uh, oh, information about uh, just kind of space planning and some building plans for the Y2 E2 building here that we'll actually use to kind of analyze a little bit and think about really how some of the issues of circulation and egress were handled for a big building like this. So if you want to, just download each of those different uh, zip files and unzip them. There's a lot of good stuff out there. You know, in addition, there's also, you'll find as we move through different sections of the class, 
if there's a special set of Revit families that will make that part of the class a little bit easier, for example, just elevators, escalators, elevator doors, and stuff like that, I'll put those out there too. Okay, so you kind of keep on building up your library full of all these little goodies that help you out. Okay, if I look at the overview, or overview of where we're going today, the idea is for the sustainable design exhibition center, or really whatever integrated project you're going to be working on, there really is this whole notion of as you go through and we work through each of the different aspects of the class, each of the three types of systems, that you go through and keep on designing aspects of it, do some thinking about that, and then blog about sort of your current thinking. And as with a lot of blogs, you know, you're going to get to a certain outcome at the end of uh, nine or ten weeks from now. But along the way, there's a lot of journey that's really interesting to capture. So everything from the just very first initial ideas, you know, what some of your inspirations are that are sort of motivating you, what some uh, big you know, buildings that exhibit some big design ideas that you'd like to think about or have some sort of innovative features you'd like to emulate. One thing is really start by grabbing examples of things that are interesting to you that you want to explore and possibly incorporate in your building. Yeah, you're not really committing that you're necessarily going to completely implement any of these things, but it's just really good to be looking around and just surveying the landscape to see what other things people are doing that are really interesting that might be good inspirations for you. Okay. Yeah. Next up, uh, you know, you're probably already starting to think about a site. If you already have a site picked up, and if you already thought a little about kind of the shape or the massing, or even how you might be working with some of the passive features available for your site based on the local climate conditions and sort of uh, the natural affordances. You might be thinking about talking about some of those things. Okay. Today we're going to start talking about your space planning and building layouts. So your first check-in might also include a little bit of that. So what's going to happen in these different check-ins is just week by week, you're just going to keep on you know, just kind of giving us our, your current state of thinking about these things. And these don't have to be long. Some people actually make them quite lengthy, but it really, it's just the idea is to kind of keep it moving and keep on sharing with each other your current state of thinking about the project. You know, so for this Friday, it'd be great to go ahead and have the first design check-in in there. There's nothing hard and fast about that. As most of you know, with most of my deadlines, no one's on Friday at 11. Alana's not there at 11.59 on Friday night, like checking them all off and that type of stuff. But let's go ahead and if you can kind of just try and stay up on it week by week and just put a little bit out there every week, it's just a little bit easier. Yeah, this is definitely one of those classes where as we meet with you and keep on checking in with you personally week by week, you know, the more you just sort of keep it moving along in small increments, the better off you are. This is the only way to really get in trouble here is to like, you know, kind of play possum and disappear for a few weeks and then show up, you know, thinking, oh, now that everything else is done, I'll do like four weeks worth of work in one week. This is really hard to catch up that way. So just kind of keep it moving gently along. We're a small group, we're friendly, it's very informal and, imper and personal here, so yeah, we all have good weeks and bad weeks, and that's okay. You can come and say, you know, I didn't get much done this week, and we'll say, okay, well, here's what to focus on for next week. But next week, if you still didn't get much done, then we'll <laughs> try and encourage you. But it's, it's, it's all okay, there's just a lot of give and take in all this. Yeah, it's just the nature of our lives here at Stanford. Okay. So to be thinking about just some of your initial ideas and to even give you a sense of what I mean by thinking about your big idea, your initial ideas and how to journal them. Again, think about going out to some of the work of these students who have done this in the past. So if you go to Bimtopia, where we've been keeping these journals, you gotta get the whole login system set up again. It's a little messed up right now. But if you go on out there and you say you want to go to building systems integration as a class, and you want to take a look at last fall student design journals, or even last spring student design journals, or even have a few from last winter, including Alana's, if you want to see what she said way back when, well, let's just do that as a matter of fact. Since she's here, why not embarrass her? Okay, so let's see if I can find over in my by students, let's see if I can find some Alana out here. So this is going sort of in reverse Quran order. So that's her more final version that she talked about prior, or in one of the previous sessions. Uh, let's check in one. So let's see what was going on here. 
some initial thinking about the overall spacing and how the sun was going to hit it. A little about her overall strategies for providing some things, some little hand sketches. Hand sketches are okay. You know, I'm going to highly advocate that. Don't think that everything has to be hard modeled and revit every step of the way. So a lot of times the quickest way to get your ideas out, I mean, I'll do a lot of these like hand sketching. Oh, super. That's enough to just get it going. It's at some level, the hardest part of most projects is just getting out of the, the starting blocks. So uh, just go ahead and think about that. Let me go out to oh, another one that was kind of good. Let's see if I have George's out here or not. You'll see when George did it, he originally did it as a sketch up model just to sort of understand the space. We have a couple of uh, just sketches that we're taking with the phone and put in there. You know, again, not too awfully deep. Oh, and as long as he's sitting right here by us, let's go ahead and see what that awful lobby did. And again, we look at his building at the end. Let's go ahead and go way back. It's like looking at your high school photos or your grade school photos or something like that, embarrassing you. Ah, now that's the beginning of a nice uh, <laughs> design, and that's really all we really want at some level. It's this notion that you know, you're thinking about the space, you're thinking about a little how it's going to be organized. You know, you look at a table like that in terms of like how we can start thinking about the total amount of space. Here's some of his, his first journal entry was actually more just about uh, things that inspired him. So you can sort of see that looks like uh, what's the Science Museum in Bellevue Park, the Academy of Art and Sciences. It's like the piano building. We have a Y2E2 building. Okay, again, you know, there, there's nothing hard and fast and whatever. It's all just like sketches and stuff like that. Okay, so be thinking about what you're going to encode there. On Thursday, I'll show you after I get the system all kind of put back together how you can go through and do that. But it's, it's basically if you grab a lot of uh, just screenshots or JPEGs, kind of keep them hanging around, and you write a little bit of text in HTML out there, and it puts it all together. So we'll keep that going through the uh, quarter. Okay, so again, every week there'll just be another check-in. It's a big rolling whatever, and we'll always give you a little guidance about the focus, and there's nothing hard and fast, but those are the sorts of issues I'd expect you to kind of be thinking about at this point in the process, so that uh, we can just always kind of keep you moving along. Okay, super. How about, I'll talk about the design journal more on Thursday. What I want to start doing today is actually to start with space planning and to think about space planning, all the different things that sort of go in, some of the tools we can use both in Reddit and outside of Reddit to help us think about this. The whole notion is that really, at some level, you probably have some program in mind, you have some idea of what your building is going to be, and you want to go through and translate that into some sort of a plan for how you're going to use your total amount of space that's available. Okay, so let's just kind of take a look at some of the things we have out there for you. I'm going to say that it's almost always going to start with a design program. You're going to have some briefing from your client, from your imaginary client, of what it is they want to see in the center. So we have an example from the Sustainable Design and Exhibition Center, but again, if you're working on your own building, you're going to come up with something similar let me just go back to the one for the Sustainable Design and Exhibition Center so you can sort of see, oh, about what we have in mind. So if you're doing that project, the briefing again, it's not too awfully rough. It's a little about how we're going to approach the process. But here's the program. Somehow your building should have a total floor area around 16 to 20,000 square feet. It'll probably have multiple floors and some different spaces called out here. A guest lobby, welcoming area, some exhibition spaces, some education spaces, meeting rooms, some office spaces. There's just some notion of what's going to be in here. So at a high level, it's really good just to sort of understand you know, what it is you're going to try to accomplish, how much architectural form you're going to try to create, and what budget you have available. Now, I was sort of suggesting around 16 to 20,000 square feet for the 20,000 square feet for the exhibition center, 
depending on your site, it may be different. It may be, for example, Gustavo, since you're working up against this existing building, we have to sort of figure out how big that is, and if we had two or three floors there, how much space that is, and also what's available on the adjacent site. Or, you know, if we're gonna think about sort of more of the wildlife center, or, yeah, just really what's gonna be a reasonable, like, program for that, just really how much space sort of makes sense. But in general, what we're looking for is, oh, a little bit of public facing, a little bit of private, and maybe some mixed, but I still like the idea that, oh, even if we were doing the kind of uh, wildlife uh, kind of rehabilitation center, you'd have some private spaces which were maybe more medical in the back of the house, and then there's some sort of exhibit space that just gets people interested in, oh, you know, why it's important that we care for the wildlife and why the whole center function you know, it's very important support for our fundraising activities and just to promote just a general awareness of why we should be sensitive to wildlife as opposed to just kind of bulldozing through it as we go through and do our development and stuff like that. So just a little bit of kind of public and private, okay, and then like some specific spaces. And just for our purposes, it'll be good if there's some, some public spaces. The idea of having these either seminar rooms or meeting rooms is that you have a room which is sort of a mixed function. It could be used sort of in an educational way, it could be used in a meeting way, but it has a function where it's not used all the time, but occasionally it gets used by a relatively large audience. Okay. Versus the offices which are sort of, oh, they're more steady state in the scheme of things. You know, chances are that whatever's happening in the offices doesn't fluctuate that much day in and day out. There's a certain demand and number of people that are working there and then that kind of like flow through there. Things like, oh, like the cruise ship center, if you go through and do that, would be sort of very interesting because there you have a very interesting peak demand. All of a sudden, like, you know, on some afternoon between this period of five hours, like, you know, 2,000 people are going to show up and need to get processed through and channeled and checked in and security screened and ultimately, you know, get to where they need to be going, something like that. But even there, as we were talking, oh, there's probably some steady state needs, or maybe some shops and some things that the public uses, but also the people coming to the cruise ship terminal could be using because, oh, they either want to snack on something as they're waiting five hours to get processed, or they've forgotten some important thing, like toiletries or whatever it is that they need. Uh, you know, there's, there's all these things that typically go into that. But what I would highly recommend is, you know, you gotta start with programming and just being able to visualize the program in your own mind. If you can't see it in your mind's eye, you're gonna have a really hard time kind of designing it. So, you know, if it starts by just looking at spaces that have the nature of what you're interested in, super. But try to write this description. And from that, we'll go ahead and try and come up with a, a space description. So, let's go back off, because a couple people have just joined us, okay? In terms of, so let's just do a little, like, for even for the new people, let's just share what our current thinking is about what our programs are now, so other people can get the benefit of it. So, uh, how, saying, so why don't you go ahead and like uh, tell us wh what's your current thinking? Are you going to still do the sustainability design center, or what are yeah, you thinking of? Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Oh, fan excellent. You may share that in a little bit. <laughs> okay, this is good. Okay, and you were still thinking kind of the cruise ship terminal, something in Kowloon, or what are you thinking now? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the museum now. Okay. Which is kind of, um, it's okay to change, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's still in Hong Kong though. Okay. So it's, it is a part of the West Coast Culture District. Mm -hmm. And then, so this museum, I'm thinking, I mean, this project, I'm thinking would consist of three buildings. One would be the museum building, one would be Sounds like a very nice, rich program, a number of different types of spaces, you know, mixed, you know, public, private, mixed, heavy use, not so, yeah, that's good. That, that feels really rich. As we get going in it, if 
if that starts to be bigger as we're designing the, you know, then we feel comfortable designing all the detail on. We may, for example, when it comes to mechanical systems or something like that, just decide to focus on one of the buildings or a portion of the building or something like that. We don't want you to overwhelm. But I like the overall kind of sense of how it fits together. Okay. Rick, you still thinking like wildlife rehabilitation or what are you thinking now? Beautiful. Mr. Gastaldo? Same. Same. Same? Okay, so, so share, share with the people uh, our, 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 new, uh, our new teammates here. <laughs> like, uh, what are you thinking about? Just to give them a sense, because they're going to be thinking in their own mind about uh, like, you know, what, what project they're going to take on. I'm retrofitting an old uh, brick city hall building, and I'm going to turn it into a community center. So I'm thinking about having like, uh, an auditorium. Things that are going to bring, bring kids and people and life and activity to the building. Stuff like that. Because offices are kind of okay, but the schemes are kind of boring. You know, you know, people who come there. It's nice to have a little life coming to the whole thing. Okay. And Alpha Lobby, what are you going to do the second time around? Alpha <laughs> 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 Lobby did it last time. I just, I just love the Alpha Lobby. Like, so he hopefully takes that in good spirit. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Your task over the next couple days is just be thinking about what you want to be doing. Yeah, and stuff like that. And it's really, again, we have a canned program if you want to follow that and just focus on just the building systems themselves and not really kind of think about the architectural side. But, or you just have to think about the architectural side, but you have to come up with a program. But if you have something, some building that's just inside you that's waiting to get out, something that you would really like to design, and this is your chance to really see it through in some detail, you know, go ahead and propose it. And we'll meet individually and kind of talk about like whatever that is. Okay? Yeah, no worries. Okay, so let's go ahead and think about how we can approach this systematically. And what I'm gonna say is that early, once you have the design program, it starts with creating this whole notion of a space plan budget, just really trying to come up with something. And within that budget, now I have Excel spreadsheet that I use, but it could really be any way you can think of aggregating it together. We're gonna think about not only what are called program spaces, those are the spaces where you know they're explicitly called out and itemized, these are things you have to create. For example, in the design center, there's some exhibition spaces, some seminar rooms, offices, cafes, and some specific things we're asking for. But what I wanna sort of draw to your attention is that in addition to all those specific things, there's a lot of squish that just needs to sort of be in place to join the spaces together and make it all work. And typically, it seems like a really large number, but if we were doing it at the university building, we'd probably be looking at like 20 to 25% space extra, okay? And that goes into all sorts of things, like those corridors out there, which no one really wants to count in their budget, but just add space. There's a lot of corridor, for example, in the wide community building. Okay. The stairways, we actually have four stairways before. One, two, three. There's only three buildings, only three stairways in this building. Okay. Plus the two elevators. Okay. So space for things like that. There's all these things which we'll call utility spaces. So even though it's not very glamorous, all those restrooms actually take up a fair amount of space. Our building doesn't have very much space allocated to mechanical spaces. Most of that is either happening up on the roof, where we actually have a fair amount of that happening down in the basement. But on the first floor, you don't see too much of that happening in here, although there are vertical shafts between the walls which connect those things, where duct work and piping and all that stuff is running that uh, makes that all happen. Okay. Another thing to think about is there tends to be this whole notion of some of those spaces working together into something that we'll often call the core, or really a series of cores, where here's what's going on. Because we 
we have, oh, the several different functions which all involve some sort of vertical connect connection going from top to bottom of the building. We tend to line those things up because it's more efficient to get them sort of lined up so that the vertical relationships can be maintained. So very often, think about it in almost every major office building you've been to. You'll go to the core, the center of the building, and you'll find the elevator, the stairs, the restrooms. All these things tend to clump together, and there's a reason for that, besides just that it sort of architecturally makes sense to put them in a central place, that mechanically what's going on in the background just wants to stack from level to level. It's just very efficient to lay it out that way. Now, we're starting to lay out your buildings. The very common thing as you start putting them together is sometimes those things will start drifting off and there'll be a restroom way over here and then there'll be a restroom way over there. And you can do that, okay, but it tends not to be as efficient as finding a way to kind of consolidate those things and bring them together so that they have a vertical relationship. Okay. But let's go ahead and start with the whole notion of this is space planning spreadsheet to kind of get a sense of what that works like. Um, if you were in the A class, we sort of did a very similar thing back there. So let me just kind of pull up the one that's in here. In uh, our session three folders, it's going to be under the space planning folder. If you go out there and if you say sample space plan, you just take a look at that. It's like just a little Excel spreadsheet. Again, there's nothing special about this. This is just my little funny tool for doing it. But any of these will work. At some level, I have, if I'm looking at the Sustainable Design and Exhibition Center, a certain amount of program space, and I have some sort of uh, just overhead spaces. And what I typically do is just sort of lay them all out. For example, there's some educational rooms. I have three of those. Try to just guesstimate what the length and the width will be. Okay, and try to come up with an area. And for doing this, the best thing is just use your experience. If you've been hanging around a Y2E2 building and you know what a reasonable education room looks like, or what a not so reasonable education room looks like. Yeah. Plug in some numbers here. Again, nothing definitive about this. It's just a starting point, a generative point. But just to sort of think, how big should an education room be? And if we were going for an area, oh, something like this room in here, I would go through and count the ceiling tiles. And if I'm measuring across here and counting these two by two tiles, I always come up with this room being somewhere around 38 feet long. In the other direction, it is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. It's just shy of 20. Okay. So for me, I actually thought as I was planning, I might like rooms that are a little bit deeper. Because I always feel this room's a little bit too narrow for the width and something like that. I always feel like we're tripping over each other like in the computer stations. So if I have my 20,000 square foot budget was allocating somewhere around 25 by 40 or around 1,000 square feet each, I'd be consuming about 3,000 square feet there. And that's what I want to do, to start by kind of figuring out how many square feet could this building actually be? And what will happen is, oh, it's like that two phase two thing where you'll be sort of aggregating up and then you'll have the budget kind of pushing down and somewhere in the middle, it's gonna get squishy about really, do I have to make the room smaller? Do I have fewer rooms? Or do you need to increase my budget? And again, there's no firm and definitive way about that. 20,000 square feet, more or less, is not a good target, but if you need more, super, again, don't come up with your day. 200,000 square feet, that's more building than you really want to design. If you have 200,000 square feet, we'll find the 20,000, which is the part you really want to design in some detail. Okay, if you only have like seven or 8,000 square feet, we'll think about ways we can add to the program to kind of make it a little bit bigger, because what'll happen is if it's too small, then the mechanical design task doesn't get that interesting. It's almost like doing just a large house. Okay, so we want to have a little more diversity in it for you. Okay, similarly, oh, we have all these different spaces. We have sort of the idea that we're going to have some cafe around 20 by 50. That would be another thousand square feet. Even here, as we were going, I was just making little notes along the side about some of the different things we might want in those. For example, for my education rooms, oh, if I want these to be, yeah, let's see, I'll just make some notes to myself. This could be sort of for computer uh, projection or set for like a, like a
lecture seating, yeah, just kind of make little notes to yourself. If you have pictures in your mind that accompany each of these different spaces, all the better. Just kind of be thinking about what sort of good spaces would be and almost think about them individually and we'll see if they all add up. The guest lobby area, oh, I didn't put any sort of space into that right now. We'll just kind of sort of put some space in there. Like, you know, how big should a lobby for an exhibition center be? Or let's say for even, oh, let's say for your community center. How, yeah. Will, will there be a place where people like come in the front door and check in? Or will they, uh, yeah. Yeah, an atrium space. Okay. Oh, so kind of part of the larger atrium. Will there be a desk or anything where like someone sits and says, oh, welcome, you know, oh, you need to go see services, blah, 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 go up here. Or once you get in there, it's just a big public space. Just big public space. Very good, okay. Any other like, uh, like lobby spaces? The exhibition center, I imagine there probably is one where somehow you came on in and you know, someone sold you a ticket or gave you a map and said, here's how you get around the space. What do you think for your building? Yeah. yeah. The bigger the building, the more likely you may need to give them some orientation, just to kind of like set them up. So I don't know, those spaces don't have to be huge. Oh, let me say, I'm going to have a space, uh, just in case a busload of people came in, I'll say just 20 by 30. A little space so that there's some room to go. But then uh, what I call the gift shop for the exhibition center, it might be sort of an information center where you pick up brochures and pamphlets and other kind of stuff in there. So uh, again, I don't sort of picture, you know, like some giant toy store, but oh, maybe 15 by 20 in there. But I'm just starting to aggregate these things. The reason is I want to sort of figure out what the total area is so I can sort of see how much programmed area I'm coming up against so that ultimately I can then figure out what the overhead is. Oh, how about for the kids zone, I'm going to say, oh, that's going to be 40 by 50. Food prep. This is always an interesting one. If I have this little cafe, I have cafe seating up there, how much space does K take to prepare food? I think we talked about this. Did we talk about it in 128? We may have got it. Like, how much space does Koopa have? Koopa prepares an awful lot of food. If you go over there and eat a Koopa a lot, a lot of food comes out. How big is that kitchen, do you think? It's like a closet. It really is. It's like, how, how big a closet is it? It's, it's really not much at all. What would you guess? Seven by five. That's interesting. I think it's a little bigger. I would say, <laughs> I'd guess 10 by 15, something like that, but it's not much. Because they have the whole, it's really, it's tiny. And again, this is going to get into your assumptions are, is, is it, you know, if you're going to have a cafe, is it a sit-down dinner place where people are waiting on you, or is it you go up and you pick up a panini, or, you know, pick up a cookie and some coffee? Yeah, in your mind, just have kind of a consistent vision about it. And well, you don't have to over-design it in terms of what's going on there, because yeah, you're not designing a restaurant. That's a whole separate thing. Okay, for these exhibit spaces, hmm. If I was going to do a museum exhibit space, what's a good size for a gallery space? Let's see how different galleries. I know this, this is a hard question because if you're in the Air and Space Museum, you have a very different sense <laughs> than in an art museum. Okay. They tend to be fairly large and sort of reconfigurable because often exhibit spaces, you want to kind of change their functionality. In fact, if you're doing sustainable design and exhibition center, I think you're thinking would be there'll probably be some permanent exhibits that hang around all the time and then some temporary exhibits that move on in oh you know this month we're featuring the latest in solar technologies so one whole gallery is like uh, all about the latest in sort of you know what thin films that can go into glass or you know just other ways of like uh, collecting as opposed to a bunch of photovoltaic panels on the roof but any sense about how big a gallery space would be there's no wrong answer What do you think, Sunshine? How, how big should a gallery space be? 50 by 80. That's fine. That's a reasonable guess. That's a large gallery, but that's a good one. So that's going to be 40. Okay. Let's say we have a big one, and let's say we have another couple that are smaller. And I'll have 
of one that's only about 20 by 30. But again, give yourself some variety, different spaces. Okay, so you see, you know, just by sort of plugging some of these different numbers in, I've come up with around 70,000 square feet. Okay, so it's pretty easy to fill up 70, 000, or 20,000 square feet. That's kind of like one of the high levels that comes out of this. But then you get to all the overheads, and this is the part I want you to be aware of. So take that number, whatever number that comes up to, and then give yourself a number, whether it's 20 or 25%, give yourself a budget of some more, and add that in, because that's going to go towards hallways, the mechanical room, the restrooms, the stairs, all those different things. And you know, you can't really necessarily call it out very easily. You could start getting more specific, but it just takes a lot of room. And give yourself elbow room. In fact, one of my big design things, and we approach this whole thing, I encourage everyone is, give yourself elbow room. If it's too tight, then it's like it's gonna be a really kind of hard project. Almost all the projects, you know, one of the first things we did when we met with people was say, oh, well, you know, why are you trying to squeeze it all in this teeny tiny little box? You know, spread out a little. You're out on the foothills, or you, you have the ability to kind of connect to nature. So feel free. It doesn't have to be just a tight little rectangular box. Could be. That's your architectural design that you want. But it doesn't have to be so tight. So come on in there. See if you can come up. In this case, all together, I'm coming up with around 21,530. And super. That's fine. If you come up and your number says 25, Again, okay, if it says 200,000, that's probably too much and we'll think about cutting back down. Okay, but just see if you can come up with a little budget. It'll just help you. Okay, any questions on that? Does that sort of make sense? Okay, super. So after we go through and we think about this kind of you know, space budget plan, typically what I get into next is basically thinking about how do I want to arrange those spaces. And you have this whole notion of different spaces, but it often starts with just thinking about how do they want to be grouped. And you can group them in a number of different ways. It's this whole idea of just some things want to be near each other, and some other things don't want to be near each other. For example, the cafe seating probably kind of wants to be near the cafe food service counter, like where you're, you're purchasing all those things. Okay. But it may not want to be right next to the restrooms. It's all that kind of thinking. The director's office, you know, may want to be near the front lobby, or maybe not. Yeah, depending on what it is, you gotta think about just who wants to be near each other and who doesn't want to be near each other. Okay, and often that's sort of based on this whole notion of oh, just different types of use. Yeah. It could be based on who needs to access that space. Is this a space where employees get to who have badges? Is this a space where the general public gets to? It could be hours of operation. For example, for your community center, it might be there's some spaces that you know, are eight to five sort of spaces. There's other spaces that stay open on Friday and Saturday nights. And you don't want to have the public spaces that stay open late into the night at the end of a hallway that passes a lot of private offices. It's that kind of just segmenting based on uh, just how it's going to be used. So that's a good way to think about it. And really, to get going with this, let me see if I can make this work. It really just starts out with just you know starting to do some drawing, and I think I don't think there's any other way to do this besides just sort of drawing. Or at least that's the methodology I tend to prefer. So let's see if we can do this relative to. Oh, well, let's go for the Sustainable Design and Exhibition Center. That's one that I sort of understand the program with right away. Okay, so. If you were thinking, yeah, you literally have the big white canvas here. Okay, and not a whole lot of anything else right now. Okay, where do we start? You know, often I start with just how do people approach the building? How do they sort of get in and circulate and you know, so you know, what's 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 the what's the front door of the building? What's the, the public face of the building that we begin to get started with? So what's the first thing they're gonna hit? There's probably some sort of lobby reception area. Let's see if we can do this. So I'll come in there. There's just some sort of lobby. Okay. Oh, that's pretty bad in terms of writing. Don't do that. Let's 
try that again. Gotta see all this funny technology. Let's see if we can make this work. Aha! Do we need to do it that way? Oh, I have to do it over here. Okay, so super, what sort of things want to be near the lobby? Ah, the food very often will be somewhere near the lobby. Let me go ahead and kind of put that in a slightly different color. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of put the food sort of stuff out here. Okay. What other things are gonna be near the lobby? Gift shop. The gift shop, almost always. If you notice, I was just at Disneyland and like, you cannot get out of a ride without somehow going to a gift shop. <laughs> Put it over there. And again, there's nothing definitive about this. Okay. What else wants to sort of be near the lobby? Bathrooms. Ah, very good. Bathrooms very often are near the lobby. Okay. Because uh, especially you know when people are just coming in off the bus and urgently need to get to the restroom, or often when people are looking for bathrooms, they'll sort of head back to the lobby and kind of position off of that. I'm going to put my bath kind of over in here. I'm starting to think ahead. Okay. What do bath and food service have in common with each other besides wanting to separate them? Um, what? For aesthetics, I'll keep them separated. But functionally, what do they have in common with each other? Plumbing. What? Plumbing. Exactly. So I'm putting them together because I'm just thinking ahead in here somewhere there may be some common core in there. Just something where if I'm bringing plumbing and drainage into that space, I might need to be sort of, sort of both ways. And I can probably do it from both sides. Okay, how about the exhibition centers? Where are these exhibition centers going to be? Where do you think? Will they be off the lobby or will they be in a separate building or again? You can dream. So I can tell you, what do you think? Should they be off the lobby or? Mine is actually near to the lobby and then the cafeteria on the other side. Ah. Like in another Ah, okay, very good. Let's go ahead. Yeah, what is it? I'll just start some exhibit spaces over here. Again, not to worry about it. It's okay. We'll just go ahead and kind of think conceptually. We can think about this in terms of you know, how you want to organize your exhibit spaces. You know, do you want to sort of have, oh, this is kind of like the journey strategy. Let me get, go back over here. You know, where you're going here, you're going here, you're going around the loop. Sometimes we sort of move through exhibit spaces like that. Other times, like the exhibit spaces radiate off the lobby. So I can go to solar, I can go to wind, I can go to water, I can go to whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of different strategies for doing that. But you probably have some exhibit spaces. I'm gonna put another one in here. Okay. I sort of like the idea that as I'm working with my exhibit spaces, um, even, you know, I don't know, maybe my little ticket counter is kind of right in here. So people come in the door and then they go in and they start going out that way. That, at no time are they very far from the lobby or for the restrooms or whatever. At the same time, the food's kind of over here, so if you're carrying your panini around, you're not necessarily walking past all the exhibits and getting your greasy fingers all over the display screens and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's kind of a, a reason for doing that. Okay, this is pretty good. This is all feeling very publicy in terms of what's going on. Okay, so let's think about a couple more spaces. What if we want to go through and have some seminar rooms or some teaching rooms? Okay, so these are rooms where, again, either a busload of school kids came in and they were going to come and attend some workshop to learn about something today. Or maybe, like, oh, you know, there's some group that's in presenting about a new technology, so people come at night and they come and attend oh, a couple hour session, learn about something, but yeah. 
to kind of get them together. So where would you put something like that relative to this? No, no right or wrong answer. Somewhere in the back. Somewhere in the back. I can sort of see that. Okay, let's think about, do they want to be, is there anything they want to be in close proximity to? What do they need access to? Do they need access to the exhibits? Should we give them access to the food or access to the bathrooms and share the bathrooms? Or what do you think? Food. Maybe, maybe they'll come for a gift gift during lunch. Yeah, I kind of like that. So I do like the notion that, oh, you know, maybe, you know, there's some seminar spaces out here. I don't know what's going on. But somehow they are kind of out there. They have access to the food court. That's actually not too bad in terms of what's going on there. They could actually share the same bathrooms or not. We can sort of think about whether that's uh, you know, to be like separate or together. Okay, super. Now, in terms of uh, thinking about how we get to these, during the daytime, you know, the Buffalo kids may come in through this way. That's sort of super. And then head on over there. Maybe there's a hallway that comes from. Right now, a little, uh, looks like I have to go through the food court to get there. And then we may not want that. It could be that, oh, maybe in here there really is some central connection between these spaces. The bathrooms are over there. But you just got to think about how you want to have the proximity between things. Okay. In terms of that, you could go ahead and have all the um, education spaces in the same area of the building, or you could sort of spread them around. Is there, is there any advantage to putting them all together? Or is there an advantage to separating them? Putting which ones together? Like uh, all these education spaces. Should I put them together or should I spread them around? What do you think? For like, thinking about like kids, maybe it's good for safety. Just like, mm. if they're nearby. I think that's actually, that, that's definitely an advantage. Yeah, you know, so you can sort of think about keeping them nearby and if there was sort of a lobby out here for the education spaces, I could sort of say, okay, you know, there's the, the kids zone is back there, so they can get to the food court, they can get there, but kind of keep them somewhat contained as opposed to wandering through everything. Yeah, you can think about it in terms of just sort of functionally, if people are gonna be coming in in the evening or something like that, and you know, you wanna be able to give people access to that space without having them wander through the exhibition center, it might be nice that way to kind of just separate them out a little bit. Yeah. How about, let's think about sort of another way of thinking about it, which is just sort of more functional. If we thought about it in terms of, let's think about hours of operation and numbers of people. Okay. As you think about, for example, these spaces, let's say you're in exhibit hall A or something like that. How many people might be in there? Okay. And there's, there's always the worst case and the best case. So I have it on an average day. Maybe it's not the grand opening of the new exhibit. You got some big old space, oh, it's 20 by 40 or something like that. Yeah, how many people might be in there? Could be 50. Okay. How about, give me a number, because oh, I got the zero and I got the 50, what's an average? What would be sort of good in there? Okay. I'm going to put 20 people over there. Okay. How about these conference rooms over here, these, these seminar rooms? Okay, so if you're hanging out here, in fact, you've been in here in the mornings when it is crowded and stuff like that, how many people fit in this space? This room is not really supposed to be 24, but it rarely is, stuff like that. We usually have about 30 people in here or something like that. Let's see if I can get that. Like going off of access, there's uh, six people signed up, 43 seats available. So. Yeah. That's what I was going off of. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's uh, there could be 40 in there. You could go to an auditorium, it tends to be very bad. Here's the deal. As you think about these spaces versus this space, let's talk about the, the nature. 
How do people wander through the state? Let's talk about that. People come in. Okay. So as you're going through and using the total space versus this space, if you if you had to characterize the two different spaces as either being a heavy, intense load, okay, or a kind of moderate, kind of continuous load. Okay. How would you characterize those two different spaces? Like, oh, for the exhibition spaces over here, is that sort of a lot of people hit it all at once and it gets incredibly crowded? Or is it kind of a steady, slow trickle through the day? create a different kind of demand on the building. Like, if I have 50 people and they're going to stretch on in, kind of just wander on in slowly at any one time, five or six new ones come in, and five or six new ones go out, okay, that's not so bad in terms of the load on the mechanical systems, the air, the heating and cooling and stuff like that. This room is the hard one. In fact, this room is one of the hard ones, the one we're sitting in right now. Okay. You've been in here in the morning and it's incredibly cold and all of a sudden like 40 people come packing on in here and they're bringing their own computers and all the computers go on and we're all sweating because we just came in from the outside and we're all breathing heavily. Like, <laughs> this place gets really bad very, very quickly. So this is considered a really kind of heavy, intense load. And that's another reason to think about just zoning things a little bit different. Is that if this is sort of more of a continuous load the way we would think about providing the building services here versus over here might be a little bit different. And that's even what we see in Y2E2. We sort of see that for the most part, we have this kind of radiant heating, which is nice and very efficient. Okay, but it's kind of slow to respond. So it's a good kind of slow system. But if you have a room where 100 people are coming in and they're breathing hard, okay, it's too slow to cool things down, so then we have things like these chilled beams that kick in and use a little bit of air and air con to kind of bring the temperature down. And you can have hybrids of the two. So that's another way to think just how we reorganize things. Okay, last thing to think about for our program here. We're doing pretty good. How about those office spaces? I got a space for, uh, I got the director's office, some people who work here and stuff like that. Where can they be? Where? What's that? Upper, upper floors is fine. That's fine. Okay. Because yeah, now tell me why you put them on the upper floor. I think it's actually a sensible decision. Why did you do it? To segregate the, uh, to separate them from the customers. Yeah. Okay. So it's they're as accessible. Okay. It's a little bit private, so the public's not out there wandering through their offices and stuff like that. They can come on down, still have access to it. Maybe there's some fantastic atrium space they can still see on down and connect. Okay, so I like the idea of the offices being up there on the upper floor. Okay, so I'm just going to put them over here for now. In terms of the offices, what do you think? Oh, I'm trying to write, and that's not very good. Okay, if I'm trying to put the offices up there, Oh, what do you think? Does everyone have their own individual office? Do we have more of an open office plan? What do you have in mind? I tend to go a little bit more open office too. Okay. So maybe there's kind of a, a big open office. However, I suspect the director may want to have his own private office, kind of hanging around there. He's got to put the squeeze on people about fundraising and stuff like that. So it's nice to have a little uh, kind of private area where you're not out in the open. No one likes to, you know, be pressing you. Uh, you know, need a little privacy for stuff like that. Okay. Oh, I also talked about there being a conference room or something like that. And we can think about it. Maybe there's a nice one down on the lower floor. I could also see them putting one on the upper floor. It's really, you know, somehow, there could be this real primo <coughs> conference room that's kind of hanging around up in there. OK, 
okay, so that the people in the offices can use it, but it can also be used as a semi-public space. But there's definitely an order to this. You have the most public space in the world to these kind of semi-public spaces, or they're a controlled public, and then this is getting pretty private up in here, stuff like that. So that's what I want you to get thinking about as you start organizing it, because it's hard. 20,000 square feet is a lot of space. How do you organize it? You know, you need some sort of rules to start subdividing and organizing the space. So just think about using this to your advantage. You know, think about how, you think about just who wants to be next to each other. For example, I'm showing it way over here, but the truth is, oh, if I have this lobby and the hallway and yada, 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 chances are the stairway that goes up here, and it's gotta probably connect back into the lobby or something like that, or not, depends on what you want. I probably have the stairs kind of coming in here Again, this isn't really, you know, spatially laid out properly, but just to give you a sense of it, I just gotta think about, do they have their own private entrance? Maybe they need their own private exit. <laughs> think about that. A lot of times people don't want to go through the visual lobby or wait in line with all the public and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe back over here, there's another uh, kind of exhibit there, or another entrance that brings them in, you know, specifically to that space. Do any of these spaces want connections to the outdoors? Let's talk about that, and then we'll take a break. Who wants to connect to the outdoors? So where do you think the best opportunities to connect to the outdoors are? Alana, where would you have us connect to the outdoors? Okay, so there might be sort of an interior courtyard or something like that. Okay, there could certainly be a nice courtyard in there. I like courtyards. <laughs> so we could have some sort of courtyardy thing in there. Oops, hang on, get the wrong thing. Okay. Of all these spaces, oh, let's think about it. Where do people want to go sit out on the patio or go outside? Like, would you ever want to have more connection from the exhibit spaces? I see a no. I'd actually say yes. We go on any other, any other yeses? Any other noes? I'd say yes. Okay, why would you want one? Tell me why I would want one. Tell me why you want one. For um, program flexibility would be one. Yeah. Also, it's kind of stuffy to always be in, in an indoor exhibit. Yeah. See, I, I could definitely go with some of these reasons. I could think of maybe not everywhere, but on some of them, maybe there's the ability to get out to some terrace or something like that. That could be part of an exhibit where getting outside is part of, you know, just going out and experiencing something in the environment or a little bit of relief space is kind of good. Maybe not everywhere. The big mistake a lot of people do when they think about a building like this is, like, oh, I'm going to come up with this fantastic glass box. I'm going to go through and create this 20,000 square foot giant glass cube, <coughs> which has sort of almost too much of a relationship to the outside because the problem with being in a glass box is, well, you can sort of realize it here. It's like, have you ever you know, noticed in classrooms, like there's rarely a glass wall behind the pre uh, presenter? People do this in PBL every once in a while. Watch out for an awful lot of people do it. So they'll make their fantastic auditorium and they'll put a glass wall behind the presenter. And the problem with that is, like, you ever been in the conference room? I was in one of the conference rooms this morning, and it was sort of happening. You're supposed to be paying attention to someone, but all you can see are the people walking by in the background going to get their coffee and all that. It's just, you know, so there's certain places you don't want glass walls. So if you want to offer a fantastic view and say that's part of the experience, put it in there. But if you're trying to keep people focused inwardly, like don't go put a big glass wall there. You know, people can't help but look through glass at things that are moving in the distance. And you just cannot help it. You're, that's genetic. You're, you're wired to do that for your own self-protection. OK, so some there. Oh. <laughs> I would probably put some sort of connection to the outdoor room from the food service area. It's a great day. I'll open my mana wall and kind of spill it onto the terrace or something like that. I kind of like doing something like that. So whether it's like an Alana scheme where we're going to an interior courtyard or whether you can get directly out there, that's a possibility too. But it's probably not everywhere. You don't need to put someone in like a 360 degree <laughs> like uh, exit from all sides sort of space. Okay. Well, 
that certainly is an interesting diagram. I'm not sure if that's helped you at all in terms of thinking about it all. But see if you can come up with some sort of similar sketches. Go back and look at the sketches in the design journals. For a lot of, it just starts with sort of little random sketches. And start by sketching because it's so much freer to do this than it is. If you start putting boxes down in Revit and start putting walls, you're going to be so hesitant to move anything that you'll lock yourself into stupid things that you'll want to change later. So see if you can get it to work just on paper first. That sounds so awful, but it's, you know, it's, it's the truth. It's, it's really much easier to do that. Don't be afraid of sketch, just all those sort of things. Okay, great. Let us take our break right now, please, if you can. Come on back in around five, if you can. Because what we want to do is, well, we won't talk too much more about space planning. I'll give you a little bit of guidance about how you understand how much, uh, how many people are using different spaces, how you want to get information like that. But we're going to talk about egress and access and how we organize buildings so people can get in and out of them safely. Okay, that's another big one. Yes. Well, can I? Yeah. Let me let me start this off recording, and I'll take it on with you. Yeah.